what made you wanted to say, okay, I actually want to do this for a career? What was the moment? I went to an event called La Paule. There was this one wine. To this day, I don't know exactly what it was. I tasted it. I was like, I did not know wine could taste like this. What is this magical elixir nobody told me about? After that, many years passed by, you know, you're starting to search for that taste again. And then when I started studying wines, you start connecting the dots a little bit, get a little bit more curious. In the middle of all this, uh, you also start studying like history and other human factors that affect it. Wine for me became a way to to study humanity almost. Wine is so connected to all aspects of humanity, past and present. A light bulb went off on my head like, oh, this is actually really, really cool. That made me want to, to study it further. I guess just for context on like why we asked you to be on um, our podcast is because so we interview content creators where we I don't even, I wouldn't even say as an interview, we just have open conversations about the creator economy with content creators. And, you know, while there are a lot of content creators that focus on making content for the sake of making content, uh, we've also highlighted creators that understand the value of creating their own brand to um, further uh, accelerate or, you know, um, promote whatever other businesses or ventures that they got going on um, outside of social media. Mm -hmm. So for an example would be someone like our friend, uh, Mike Nouveau, who's a uh, watch dealer. Um, he gets all of his business through his um, social media. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mentioned Andre Mack, who's a very visible psalm, and um, we've had we've had like off camera conversations with him, but I came across your page and um, you are a Korean Mexican by way of American Psalm based in New York, who's very active on social. And I just thought that that was like an interesting combination of identities that I just felt very inclined to link. And coincidentally, this one night that I randomly went to this restaurant called Crown Shy, we went up to the rooftop bar. We were supposed to have a conversation later that week and she happened to be there. Like I haven't even met this person in the yeah. physical. So she happened to be there. I was like, oh, wow, this is very serendipitous. Um, now we got a link. Right. right. So <laughs> this is why we're I mean, that's the reasoning behind why we wanted to uh, link with you. I mean, why don't we just start with like, you know, you know, but like, who are yeah. you? Yeah. Tell us who, who you are. Who am I? Uh, well. How do I? It's always kind of hard to explain. I, I guess a Korean who grew up in Mexico City. And then I came to the States for college, uh, did design for like seven years. And then I'm a career changer. I've been in wines for about a year and a half now. Um, and then I started making content in the middle of the transition. And here I am with you guys. Uh, it's kind of a crazy turn of events that happened um, for this to happen, but yeah. Can we can we dive in a little bit more? Yeah. So how'd you end up in Korea? Were you like, how early did you did you immigrate there then? Uh, Mexico, sorry, Mexico, Mexico sorry. Yeah. yeah. So so how did I end up in Mexico? Yeah. So my parents um, travel around to like Spanish speaking countries because my dad majored in Spanish, which for his generation was not a common thing. Mm -hmm. So he got sent to Panama, which is why I was born there, and then he got sent to Mexico uh, for his job. So he worked in like a trading consulting ish job. Uh, so we lived in Mexico for a while. So I did all first grade through 12th grade before I moved to the States for college in sure. Boston. Oh, wow. Am amazing. <laughs> yeah. What language do you dream in? Dream oh, good question. Um, mostly English and I think Korean. And then they would be like, if it's like a really frustrating dream, they would be like Spanish <laughs> swear words here and there, but definitely mostly English. That's amazing. And so you must be fluent in all, all three then, right? Mm -hmm. For the most yeah. part, I would say so. But English is definitely my strongest. Although at this point, I feel like I don't speak any languages because uh -huh. I'm not completely fluent in any of them. Um, but yeah, this is, this is very... <laughs> no, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you, how did you make the transition from, I mean, you told me all, uh, earlier that you were working as a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. How did you make that transition into wine? Yeah, so I was always interested in food and drinks. Um, I was like, that was my obsession. That's where all my money went all the time, dining out. 
and COVID happened. And I feel like a lot of people go through that existential crisis um, or multiple because I got laid off twice during that time. And I started thinking, well, is this what I really want to do? Well, I thought there was job security in like a nine to five. Turns out it's really not. Uh, so I started brainstorming and just took some wine classes. And that really got me thinking like, wow, this is really cool. This is really fun. So I started taking a Somalia training program and I passed the exam. Um, and then I got it's like an offer to become a SOM unexpectedly. So I took the job, quit my other job, and that's just how it all just happened one after the other. Felt pretty natural. Um, and then in the middle of studying, I knew like this is something I could obsess over for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So that was like a reassuring thing that I don't, I will never get bored of it. So it was just a very natural way of happening. It's crazy. So almost just during the pandemic, it, other people learned uh, how to make sourdough starters or, or start cooking on TikTok. You, you became a song, right? Pretty uh, much. Yeah. That's just like how my career started <clears throat> changing after all. Yeah. That's amazing. And then what's the typical process of becoming a SOM? Like, is it how long does it take? Are there different levels? I, I, I remember watching the Netflix documentary a really long time ago about SOM and they were they were studying for a crazy exam. Is that the same exam that you took? It's the same trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going through the quarter mass of sommeliers, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the ways you could do it. Um, so it's a series of exams you could take uh, from level one to like there's intro, certified, advanced, and a master SOM, which is what the documentary yep. and movie is based on. Um, and you can take those exams kind of like a credential, but there are so many other SOMs that I know that I really highly respect that normally they don't even take the exams. Um, so there's not one way to become a SOM. Some people just climb up the ladder, um, become servers, captains, and then SOMs by just self-studying. Um, and then there's like the W set, which is another program. So there are so many ways you could become a SOM, but I just chose to do the training program because I didn't know a lick about wines. I just knew I liked wine. Mm -hmm. So they kind of ha handheld me to kind of uh, study and give me a little bit more of like a guideline to what to study. And then the one that you you chose, the path that you chose is, is that the, you know, like even in culinary, we do a lot of food content. There's CIA, there's, there's, Cordon Bleu, uh, there's a lot of different programs. Mm -hmm. is, is the program that you went through the one that is like the most widely recognized or sort of, you know what I mean? I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the course itself is recognized by <clears throat> the court of master sommeliers. Um, so they kind of approve it. Um, and then you don't have to take that course, but you can just also just take the exam. Um, but I chose to take the course. So um, one of the theses that we have around, um, especially for creators, right? I think creators are in, in their own right. Um, their creators are connected to their own communities, right? So in the past, someone that wanted to build a community would have to go through the credentialing of a, you know, working somewhere, going to a certain uh, school or going through a certain program, they'd have to go through that. But now with social media and the ability to, you know, connect and, and build community right away, you're able to bypass a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. So things like school, for example, I have three young kids. I always think school is becoming less and less important if they want to, you know, get a job in, you know, fill in the blank industry, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening also in the SOM space? I mean, it's kind of evident by the fact that you started during the pandemic and now are a SOM with your own community. But like, what do you, is, do you find that to be true in that space? I would say so. I think it's true in so many spaces now because of the amount of information that's available so widely and freely, no matter what the niche is. Um, so definitely. And I feel like I know enough people whose hobby is just, you know, enjoying fine wines. They know so much more than me because they just drank more and they've had more experiences and exposure to these. So yeah, definitely. I feel like that education, like formal educational, like format doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, I would imagine that, that the traditional legacy and the folks that sort of are at the top or have been around for a long time, they're, they're probably hating on that new, new class, right? I could totally see that. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, <laughs> I won't comment on that too much, but I'm sure there is a group of people who um, kind of feel like, oh, I went through all this. You should, too, to get the credentials that I worked so hard to build, which I understand. Um, so I'm sure there's that group of people. But I think for the most part, the wine community is just so 
welcoming and warm. So I feel like there's both sides to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. considering that you're getting drunk, I hope people are welcoming, <laughs> um, not belligerent. Um, but, but with wine, I could totally see it being so inclusive and open because yes, what's better than having a, a, a glass of wine with someone? Yeah. But there's also, and I'm not a wine drinker. Me neither. But, but, but the, like, but wine the, feels bougie to me. Yeah, I mean, like, the notion is the barrier of entry of <laughs> becoming a psalm in itself seems like costly. For the most part, I mean, you know, you mentioned that, you know, there are certain people that just know more about wine than you who is doing this as a profession just because of their access to different types of wine. You know, what are some of the challenges of of becoming a psalm even like mm. do, can you share some of that intel yeah. with us? I think it's just purely discipline and amount of information that you have to memorize. And it is purely a memorizational almost besides the tasting portion, because you have to know what different regions make and what certain words mean. But at the end of the day, if you put in the hours, you just build all these like cards of knowledge in your head. And I feel like that's just what the most difficult part is, just discipline. Um, but then the tasting, it's the same thing. Uh, you have muscle memory and you have like sensory memory. So it's all about just revisiting different wines and the same wines over and over again. And it's just a natural course of like building that own library of what certain things taste like. Um, I always kind of compare things to other niche, like, you know, it could be fashion or like even books because my friends really love books. Um, from the outside perspective, they always look very intimidating because like, I don't know anything about fashion, for example, or like these really crazy literary figures. Um, but once you start reading one more book or buying one more piece and you start studying the history or the meaning behind each of these things, then do you like in design or uh, fashion, for example, you learn about other designers and then you just kind of spread your knowledge that way, just very organically. I think it's the same thing with wine. It just looks very intimidating. But once you approach it with genuine curiosity, everything just kind of opens itself up to you. That's how I see it. So how did you get into it? Like you were, you know, all of us like to wine and dine, as they say. And living in New York, the options are endless. And it is also very costly. Mm. Um, yeah, like what made you wanted to say, okay, I actually want to do this for a career? Like, was there a specific wine where there was a catalyst? Like you went to a winery, you went to like, like what was the moment? I think it was a series of moments. Some even before I started studying wines, uh, I went to an event called La Pelle, which is basically a celebration of Burgundy harvest. Um, and I attended really long time ago for a client and there was this one wine to to say I don't know exactly what it was because again I did not know anything about it uh, I took a sip of that it was definitely a white burgundy because it was a burgundy festival um, I tasted it I was like I did not know wine could taste like this mm. this is incredible what is this magical elixir nobody told me about um, and after that many years passed by you know you're starting to search for that taste again that experience and then when I started studying wines, I learned like, oh, that was Burgundy. I tasted other Burgundies. And you start connecting the dots a little bit, get a little bit more curious. And in the middle of all this, uh, you also start studying like history and other human factors that affect it and like all the trends. So it's just wine for me became a way to study humanity almost. It sounds very dramatic and it sounds like really like out there, but wine is so connected to all aspects of humanity past and present and it's just like a light bulb went off on my head like oh this is actually really really cool and that made me want to to study it further and deeper and i like the service aspect of it so while studying again um i started working as a server just to gain experience and be more comfortable being on the floor just to make sure this is what i want to do and then I really loved it. Like I love hosting people. And then um, that just translated into, oh, I'm pretty good at dealing with people on the floor. So putting those combined, it became like a natural course of action to want to become a floor psalm. There's this notion that when you're dealing with a psalm or at a restaurant that has a psalm, uh, the customers are expecting a type of an experience, right? And you're probably dealing with 
customers that have deeper pockets, you know what I mean, that want to make sure that their experience is top notch. Um, and whatever recommend that you, they, they might also try to test you, right? I'm assuming in terms of mm. knowledge, they're like, yo, like, let me just quickly G check. Like <laughs> yeah. if this person knows if this is from France, where Italy, where ah, ah, whatever it may be, you know, have you been like, yeah, how, how, like what are some of the challenges of navigating that space, you know, as a person who is now working as a song? Definitely the different personalities. Cause you don't know who to expect. You don't know what they're going to ask. You don't know like if they're even interested that much or maybe, you know, again, there are so many people that know more than I do. So it's that unknown, that uncertainty that I think is the most challenging and being ready for any situation. Um, so you always have to be on your toes, kind of like, okay, what are they, what are they looking for? But what are the expectations? There's probably archetypes though. I don't know that, that my mind always works in like a, a cr like a content sort of a way, but you know, here are the five types of people that you run into as a sum, right? So you, <laughs> that's you, actually a good right? piece of content, right? Yeah. So like you run into like the 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 Wall Street bro who's in here like splashing the card. You have someone who is trying to look like tr trying to be fancy, but is not really fancy and trying yeah. to make an impression. There's so th there's probably like all these different types of yeah. archetypes that you see over and over. Yeah. And then it's just give us a few archetypes <laughs> actually. Oh my God, that's actually so good. And you mentioned two really good ones. There's yeah. definitely those um, finance bros or people come with their corporate cards and of course it's approved, but they're trying to maximize that experience yeah. on with the company's dime. Yeah. So they don't know much, but they definitely want to make an impression with to their other coworkers. Um, there's that type. And then there's always that So what that do they type. order? Like what's like mm -hmm. an item that they order? Let's actually workshop this content video oh, together. Oh, that'd be so fun. So um, it's like Wall Street finance bro <laughs> with corporate card usually orders. An Opus one. Right. Honestly, not not that far <laughs> off. Uh, we're we're both we're all gonna get so much hate for this, but people generalize. And um, I worked at three restaurants now, and each time we all have very similar ideas on what people are gonna order. Yeah. And those kinds of finance pros were like, "What do you think they're gonna order?" And mm. we're just like whispering to each other. We're like, "They're definitely getting a Napa cab." Yeah. And a lot of the times we're right. Okay. Or, so yeah. finance bro, corporate cart, Napa cab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go down the list. Who else is like an archetype? Um, and then there's like a couple that come on a date probably their first three days and the dude's trying to trying really hard <laughs> like trying really hard to make an impression and he clearly doesn't know much but he wants to appear as if he knows because he wants to impress the date sure. yeah um so I'm, I'm sorry i'm using he but it's just statistically uh -huh. that's just more frequent yeah and then he strikes up a conversation trying uh -huh. to test you uh, -huh. uh and you know you just speak with them and have a conversation and it's just he runs out of things to say real quick so you're like, oh, okay, let me help you out. <laughs> so you like handhold him, try to make him look good. And those people normally end up ordering like a, around $200 burgundy, um, cause that's very safe, it's tasty. Or no, burgundy, I think I'll stick to that. $200 burgundy, more or less. And then the and then you probably have the the person reading the entire book, right? The wine nerd, right? So it's like, hey, so what do you think about? And then and then they're mm. it's almost like they found a community member, right? I've gone with friends like this. They find yeah. a community member and they're like, hey, what do you think about this? And they're like, oh, actually. And then there's like a you probably you probably get a little excited when you meet people like this, right? Yeah, that could go one of two very different. <laughs> well, you ways. can't you can't walk away from the table. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, so archetype three is the wine nerd. Tell us what mm. does what does this person usually order? Let's I think let's backtrack and go back to people who spend a long time reading the book. And then that just branches off to two different, completely different scenarios. One is a wine nerd and they end up ordering a really nice like aged Bordeaux or Burgundy, most likely. Um, and then the other side is they're going leaf by leaf and they end up ordering probably one of the cheapest wine you could order. And that's the reason they're flipping through. So when we catch someone flipping through the wine list, we're like, ooh, which one's it gonna be? Are we gonna have a baller night or is it gonna be a kind of a no offense disappointment <laughs> because we were so excited for it. So it could go one of two ways. Interesting. Okay, so there's been like three archetypes this fall. Like let's, like girls on a girl night, girls night out. 
there's that's probably a type of a customer type as well right they're having yeah. like some sort of uh I but are, 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 i think they're drinking a cocktail don't know are they drinking a cocktail or are they drinking wine cocktails very often yeah. um and they normally start or end with an espresso martini so i don't even have to touch that okay. table okay. or they end up ordering like a I hate to say the stereotype, but very often rosés, especially as the weather gets yeah. warmer, or a very crisp sunset mm -hmm. or okay. Shipley. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, who else do we that, have? That's my wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, and they were delicious. Yeah. No hate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No hate Shout at out. all. <laughs> Please don't cancel us. <laughs> um, all right. So, who else? We have we have the ladies that are ordering rosé. Uh, we we let's just get one more so we could not. I mean, down there's the so fire. many, right? I I think. Um, I mean, again, I'm not a wine drinker, but the yeah. I try to always pay attention to everything and yeah. like the culture around it is very, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other people that like, they're literally like, yo, I want the most expensive thing. Or, I want yeah. the craziest mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, like, just cuz, you know what yeah. I mean? And it's not necessarily as a flex, but that like, that's that's what it is, right? I've also seen, like in, uh, like in Vegas, I've seen the, you order a crazy expensive bottle of wine uh, and then they'll, they'll mix it with like Coca-Cola. Have you heard of have you heard of this? No. Yes, they'll 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 order like a screaming eagle and then like they coke and like what they'll do oh, whatever. So they're just on some like I'm so rich. I can no, fuck that's actually how. Shit. Yes, but okay. it's like it's probably new money. It's Again, just like I don't want, new, I'm offending everybody. But yeah, like, we're yeah. all offending yeah. so many people. Right <laughs> yeah. It's just straight flex. Straight flex, new yeah. money China. Like oh they have God. so much money. Yeah, but then they like drinking it that way. Right. They want to drink it like their version of a sangria or something. That's you know? yeah. crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's really expensive sangria. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was like the first oh. time that I saw this one kid, um, this Chinese cat um, in Long Island City. He was rocking like a Balmain shirt and he was playing basketball in it. <laughs> I was like, yo, that's a nice shirt that you're playing basketball in. It was like, oh, this is the only shirt I have. I was like, oh, good for you. Wow, you know just I mean? sweating through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. I was like, yo, good for you, dog. You know what I mean? Um, but so... I kind of wanted to get the last archetype, but if you, do you have anybody else that's in your memory bank, in your Rolodex? Mm, they kind of overlap, so yeah, nothing yeah. like crazy different, I would okay, say. So like, yeah. Okay, so we have the wine nerd, the finance bro, uh, the ladies going out, and then who else did we have? The guy trying to impress. The guy the trying to impress. And person trying to impress. The yeah. person trying to yeah. impress. <laughs> Why don't we get like a hipster? Like a like a mm. Brooklyn, Bushwick, borderline <laughs> Ridgewood hipster doesn't have the same pocket as the finance bro. Is not trying to impress. Not necessarily the archetype white nerd, but mm. they're on all the Reddit threads and shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, How is that different from the wine nerd though? I think it's a little bit because when I envision a wine nerd, I'm thinking somebody a little bit older, mm. or maybe an older person, an older person with more financial stability. They've traveled. They go to Italy every summer. You know what I mean? Like that person. When that person yeah. pulls up, like they're probably trying to test you, no? Sometimes. Or like they're, even if they're our age, like 30s, 40s, they're in tech. Mm -hmm. So they have the deeper pocket, but they have the means. So they have tried so many different wines and yeah. therefore they're wine nerds. Mm -hmm. They're also in the same category. Right. But that wine nerd is different than like, I can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. but So I only know about it just through like me doing extensive research. And True. following Andrew Mack and Andre Mack on YouTube. Yeah, I think those bros, hipster bros, tend to be uh, natural wine. Yes. Fans. Yes. So see, yes. There yeah. we go. That's the five yeah. archetype, right? There. That is a natural wine. Yeah, that's yeah, the natural wine. They love kid. natural yes. wine. Yes. yes. Koreans are obsessed with natural wine right now. Really? They've been. They've been the past like five years, right? Again, it depends on like they yeah, they either want true. like a Chateau Lafitte because that's what they know, or they want natural mm. wine because they're like they're rocking like you know whatever you wear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> you know, you know yeah, what I mean? exactly. And yeah. they just know yeah. they they go to record bars. Yeah, they you know, go to record they, bars. Yep. They, they, yeah, they go yeah. to a record bar, right? Yeah, and exactly. they're drinking craft beer as well. Yep. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Japanese whiskey. That's on the cheaper end. You know what I mean? But <laughs> wine's so expensive in Korea. Like I don't know how people can drink wine. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I could never. I guess uh, going on the utility side of it, I, I do want to ask you about the day to day of being a SOM, but like from a utility standpoint, what's a what's like a grail wine for you? Wow. Yeah. Actually, let's hold that thought. Hold okay. that thought. We want to bring in the food because it is creator's lunch yeah. at the end of the day. 
Do How it. is it so far? Like the combo? It, Very is good. It yeah, <laughs> it flows. I was really nervous that I would be super awkward. No, which I, I still am a no, little no, awkward. Not at but, all. Uh, it's, no, don't it's don't okay. feel awkward. <laughs> but yeah, this is kind of like what we do. We we try to have conversations around um, how we could be helpful um, with everything. So, I mean, you're super active on social. What made you want it to be like, okay, like I actually want to tell the people about my journey as a psalm. And yeah, uh, I did not intend on creating any content. Uh, I did not know it would be like this. So what, back when I was still working um, in design, my boss kind of forced me to try out TikTok because I, I worked for like a more younger, uh, younger demographic brand back then. And he was like, you have to get familiar with TikTok, go do it. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. And I was studying for like some exams back then. So I thought, okay, if I'm gonna create content and just test things out, might as well just teach people things that I'm trying to memorize and study because it's good for your memory retention. And then I just posted a couple things and one of them just blew up. And that was like my first mini viral thing it was like 200K and I was like, holy crap, this is crazy. What was it? It was about scotch. Like I love scotch mm. and I was just like teaching people about the differences between like what scotch is and how it's made versus other whiskeys. And people really liked it. So that was a start. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. And then started making more and more. Can you tell us a little bit more about the video? Like, was there a story arc? Like, were you just explaining things? What was it about? And how yeah. how how, um, how strategic was it? Did you know that it had a chance or it completely caught you off guard? Very surprised, very surprised. Did not expect it at all. Uh, I never really have a plan. I just do whatever the heck I want. Um, I think I do have the luxury of doing that because it's not my full-time job. Um, so I post whenever I feel like it, and it was just one of those things. I just started explaining, and then I guess people really like scotch, and it's just the algorithm kind of, yeah, made it blow up. So this is before you were even a song. This was before, this way you were before. Still a designer, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Way before. What kind of what kind of design were you doing? I was doing graphic design, so uh, it was more like digital. Everything was digital, so it was like more leaning towards digital and social media. Okay. So I was very familiar with like the format and like editing for this platform in general and social media. So I think that definitely helped um, to see what people might look for eventually. Yeah. How has uh, social media helped you uh, with your now this newfound career? Hmm. I think it's probably the other way around where my career helps the content creation just because people are interested in seeing, oh, this is an industry people don't really share their day-to-day -day as much compared to other kind of industries. Are there other content creators in the wine space that are very active with like vlogs and the type of stuff that you make? Um, I think not in the format that I do. Um, there's a lot of wine creators, but they do like more snippets of Wine 101 content. Um, and there's a lot out there. And then there's a couple others. Um, yeah, they don't they don't really do day to day, but they do more community or just like educational videos. So how would you classify the content you make and how is it mm. different? Yeah, I think I started weaving in a lot more personal day to day things in addition to educational. So I think it's more of a holistic view of what I do and how I live as opposed to just wine education or just some day in the life content. Mm -hmm. So I think I started trying to build a personal brand around who I am as opposed to just what I do, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. Yeah. And how much of that is informed by like your, um, what informs that is a better question. Why did you start to go down that path? Um, I just felt like it got a little boring for me only doing educational content. And then mm -hmm. it takes a long time. Like I do a hand-drawn things for everything and I animate them. <laughs> so I was like, okay, it's taking too long. I don't want to get burnt out or get bored of it. So I just did like one or two, what I did in a week or what I did to study. And those were received very well. So I was like, oh, I can weave in other things and people are still watching. So I might as well make this like more than just educational. How often are you iterating new formats? 
very inconsistent. I don't know. I okay. can't say. Uh, I'm I'm inconsistent in a lot of ways in content creation. Like right now, I'm in a lull. I uh, haven't really been posting too much because I just don't feel like it. I've been kind of feeling like eh. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are days I'm just like pumping one a day uh, mm-hmm. for like four days in a row. So it's just been like pretty pretty inconsistent. I saw, I recently saw one of the videos where you said, uh, "This is all supposed to be fun, but no matter what." You're gonna. You're not gonna make everybody happy. Essentially, yeah. how often are you doing stuff like that? And what was it? I mean, obviously, the catalyst was feedback from people that are watching. But mm-hmm. like, w- I love those types of videos from anybody because that that's that kind of stuff is so authentic mm. and genuine. And I think people really resonate with that. Was that a rare occurrence, or is that something you do regularly? Very rare. Okay. I think it's a, the first time I ever talk into a camera like that okay. because I've been so frustrated. And I think every content creator would relate um like yes we can in- we try to ignore trolls as much as we can but if you're having a particularly bad week particularly bad day and it's always like that last drop that sets it off i think it was like one of those days and i was like so mad and so upset that i just posted that video just to vent and it got received really well surprisingly i thought i would get some more hate but people were so encouraging. Uh, they were just trying to make me feel better. Uh, so yeah, it's like a little reassurance that community really shows up. And that was really cool. Um, what ways are you trying to engage with your community? Have you done, do you do events regularly? I try. Mm-hmm. Um, so on my days off, like I try to do once a month, uh, whether it's like a dinner. So I did a series of pop-ups with some industry friends uh, recently, once a month. but. I'm so tired right now. That's going to be on, on hold. But I'm trying to do like wine events or like meetups, uh, stuff like that. Just because I think people just want to be a part of the community. I think it'd be really cool to meet them in person. And when you meet them, uh, who are they? Like, wh- what's your audience look like? Uh, so according to social media, like when you see the analytics, most of my audience is like, I would say 65% women around my age. Mm-hmm. So I think they definitely kind of see something that they resonate with. So that's like the big chunk. And in the events that I've hosted so far, uh, pretty pretty similar in that age group. Um, there's a couple people from the industry that I know who show up sometimes, but I would say that's like the demographic. It's like the same. You like food, you like community, you like wine, and you're open to meeting new people. That's like the biggest common denominator. Have you ever thought about becoming a full-time content creator? Mm. Surrounding the concept of wine. You Mm -hmm. know, because I guess a question for me would be, like, what is the career trajectory usually of a song? Is it, do they usually, like, progress into becoming consultants for bigger wine companies? Do they co-own restaurants? Um, Yeah, like, if you could shed light on that. Yeah, um, those are all different paths someone can take. Um, I think I've seen so many different paths that people take after being in Floor Slum. Um, Some people become wine directors. I think that's a pretty common uh, way to go up to the next step. Uh, You have your own beverage program. Or I've seen people who become general managers. Um, They like the more overview of that, uh, like a restaurant business. I've seen people who go into sales, uh, open up their own wine bar or restaurant in partnership with other people. Some people go into journalism. So I feel like there's so many ways you could choose to go. Uh, for me, I'm not quite sure yet. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, but it's it's just so new to me still. But I don't think I will be a full-time just content creator. I do plan on investing a little bit more time just because I really enjoy it. But I just love being in a restaurant setting. I think that's really fun and it's really engaging and that's where I want to invest the most time Mm. for now at least. Would it be owning the restaurant or or just being a part of it or if you zoomed out and you and you were trying to squint and see in the direction what does that kind of look like? I'll probably stay as a part of a restaurant for the next at least one or two years and then beyond that in an ideal world because Mm-hmm. Let's say I get investors miraculously, mm-hmm. um, then maybe I think I would love to have my own space where I can do these events and have a community space for my friends and beyond uh, without having to worry about, you know, making it happen. Like there's like a constant somewhere 
Uh, so that would be an ideal case scenario. So if you were to become a very well-known, acclaimed wine content creator, uh, wouldn't it be more likely that investors would want to work with you? Mm, that's a good point. I yeah. frankly never thought about it that mm. way. But I think part of me is also scared just because I don't know how flaky people can be because people on the internet can be very flaky uh, and they can change their mind quite easily. You're talking about your community? Not my community specifically, but just like in general. Yeah. Uh, so if I were to base my invest like investors um, and kind of funding or some something with the use of social media, I don't know if that would be as stable as, I don't know, having like a personal connection through other restaurants. I don't know, but I have no idea how it works. Very, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, tying back to the day that we met. So <clears throat> I first got acquainted with Chef Jamal James Kent through social media. And that was actually the first day that I met him. Oh, wow. um, and it was through another friend, shout out to Jerry, who um, hosted the dinner at Crown Shy. And I had no idea that uh, Daniel Hum and the EMP team were gonna be there that day. Mm -hmm. Like Jerry just told me, you'll pull up. And I was like, oh shit, like, you know, like you got like some of the top guys in New York food just happened to be in the same cipher that day. And, you know, I don't know shit about food. Like I, I know what I like. I know the restaurants that we highlight and we, want to champion them in the best ways that we can, but it was through TikTok videos mm -hmm. that I had these guys who are, you know, A-level Michelin star winning, top of the line chefs checking in with me. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I spent 20 years in the kitchen and, you know, I have nothing but respect for people that came up that way as well, but it was, through content and storytelling that I was even recognized by, you know, these, these, these esteemed food figures. So I guess, you know, the point I'm trying to get at is because you already have this community that you're building upon, what's to say that these opportunities of what you want to accomplish can't be done mm. by growing a bigger community, right? That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. You never know. And yeah. you never know who you're going to get connected with. And I think that's the beauty of this whole social media. Yeah, if now. anything, like just from this experience of us working on Righteous Eats and, you know, the my personal Jakey Cho channel and just social media in general, like now that we've done it for three years, going into three years, um, <clears throat> what initially was a you never know what opportunities are going to come, it became like, no, actually, you know exactly what opportunities are going to wow. come. Wow. Wait, yeah. can you give me an example? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you want to share some examples of some, you know, it's going to happen? All of our partnerships, you know, we knew that we would have politicians in the DM. We knew that we would have wow. financial companies. We knew that there would be consumer brands. We knew that there would be a high end and a low end Hot, fine dining and uh, everyday accessible dining all coming together. We knew that, you know, it would, it would be, it wouldn't just be people that look a certain kind of way or spend a certain amount of money. We, we knew like all of it. Yeah, for sure. It was very, um, very not planned, but it was, it was, it was definitely like in the vision. Right. Mm. And I think to the bigger point, and the reason why we're doing this is like social media isn't a nice to have. It used to be. Mm. It's a must, right? So when you're when you're building any sort of product today, your value uh, is your distribution. And whether you're opening a new restaurant, uh, a marketing agency, a uh, you know a sports team, at the end of the day, that your brand and 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 what that brand can do in terms of distribution, like that's everything. And a long time ago, those that distribution used to be owned by owned and controlled by what city you're in, where your actual thing was, what end cap you got in a certain store. But all of that is breaking down because mm -hmm. if you have enough of a connection to your community, then you might be on the bottom shelf 
in the very back and people are still going to go out and find it. True. Right? Yeah. Or they might not even need you need you to be inside of a big retailer because they'll just buy it online and it'll get shipped to you. True. That's a right? good point. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, that's the thing that we always talk about. It's like, uh, you know, the reality is, yeah, you could, you could spend 20, 30 years being a master song, have all the credentials, do, do your thing, and then there could be an 18-year-old who grew up on, on this, mm. does all the studying, does all of that, builds a community and has much more sort of a, much more of a community and has much more of an impact. That's the other thing about wine is uh, wine feels very old. Obviously, you have to be a certain age to drink it. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a certain age to drink alcohol. But it's also another thing where like if they can't connect to younger audiences, I mean, I, I read all the studies about like younger people just don't drink as much as we used to drink. Right? They don't, right? They're, they're taking edibles. They also don't want to work as much. <laughs> That's definitely a fact. <laughs> you know, like we, we tell our guys like, Yo, we'll pay you more. <sighs> And it's like, nah, but still, like, <laughs> this is the quarter that I just want to hit. I'm like, all right, you know, so it's just a different perspective. And again, yeah. this is all stuff that I don't knock because, yo, like, it's progress. It's evolution. Yeah, maybe you do need to have, like, work-life balance and take yoga classes and meditate and, you know, drink less. You know what I mean? Because, yo, look at the way that we turned out. Fucked up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I get it. You know what I mean? So, yeah, so to Brian's point. You know, one thing that we emphasize constantly is just the importance of community. And I mean, even you um, having a clapback and the community coming to your defense, be like, yo, fuck the haters, like, we got you. That probably wouldn't have existed if you didn't have 60,000 or more followers on Instagram. That's totally true. Right? And yeah. the, su the support is probably coming from people you never met in real life. Never. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy to think um, there's that bond we have through internet. It's just, it's nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And I've never met them, they've never met me, and there's still that connection is pretty crazy. It's really, really insane. And yeah. that you get to control that district. I mean, yeah, sure, we don't own Meta, we don't own TikTok, mm -hmm. we don't own YouTube, but the fact that you're able to, these people could slide in your DMs and actually have a conversation if you're willing to, I mean, we didn't have that. I mean, I didn't have that, you know, at least when I was like 15. Right. Like it was radio, TV, you know, these are all channels that you had to go through a, a person that, lack of a better word, a gatekeeper hmm. who could give you access to that, right? And now we don't. Like what makes a really good wine creator, in mm. your opinion? My opinion, uh, just relatability and no, none of that snobby, like, oh, we got gatekeepy behavior, I think number one. And if you pass a vibe check, um, how concisely and clearly you can relay whatever information you want to convey in a shorter amount of time. And editing, not in terms of the fancy equipment necessarily or like fancy editing softwares, but how you cut your information to, again, go back to that ease of information distribution. I think that's like the two things. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you, do you do you have any signs of like um, authority or subject matter expertise that that you need? Like so, what I saw was number one, vibe check. Number two, uh, your ability to communicate clearly and concisely. So being a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. but I think concise is very key. Concise right, you have key, to be yep. you have to be pithy. Also, because right. yeah, because you're considering social like short form content as yeah. well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So concise is definitely important. And then is there another third sort of like, je ne sais quoi or something else that stands out and makes like the ones that you tune into or you admire sort of like even that much better? If there's a commonality in terms of the type of wine, for example, maybe your focus is fine wines or maybe your focus is on natural wines. So um, I become friends with them. They're pretty big on social media now. They're called Super Vino Bros. I'm sure you've seen so many videos. Super Vino Bros? Yes. Okay. They have like a Mario and Luigi like logo type. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, really, yeah. really awesome. Um, they blew up on the internet because they're marketing themselves around um, natural wines and mm -hmm. they're also learning. And going back to like, oh, how much expertise? I think it just goes back to the authenticity of the content you're trying to create. Yeah. Because they're like, you know what? We don't know that much about wines. Why don't you learn with us? And you kind of grow with them. And that's why they're so endearing. And it's just so much cooler. And they do their research and they do their studying. 
but they do it in a format that's just so approachable and just so genuine. So I yeah. feel like that's why they're so successful too. Amazing. For sure. Yeah, they, they, they're they not trying to act like they're subject matter <laughs> experts. Mm -hmm. You know, they're willing to be vulnerable and say shit that they don't know. Right. And admit to it. 100%. And, and that fact. Okay, that part. Um, so <clears throat> as, a, as someone that makes content, what are your biggest challenges? Are there any ways that we can help? Or anything is that, you know, we're around creators all the time. We make content on multiple channels every single day. Are, are there any things that you're curious about or any ways in which we can help? Oh, man. I think just in, ter in times of uncertainty or like you need a little bit of validation or just like even like the fact that people can relate whenever like something I don't know, annoying or weird or sad happens. I feel like having that community in itself is really awesome. Um, but question wise, I can't think of one right now. Okay. But yeah. We should definitely set up a couple introductions. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Yo, I don't know if the Pooja thing has legs, but like that seems funny. And yeah, it seems like it's gonna be it could be yeah. a great piece of content if you want to execute yeah. on it. If or you even want to yeah, do like yeah. skits. Sure. Yeah, we'd love to connect. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool you guys um have built such a wide network of different kinds of creators. I think that's just so fascinating. It's pretty inspiring, honestly. Makes it's me not, want that, to it's not that wide yet, you know. What I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's pretty limited. To we actually honest. want it to be wider. Like mm. when are we gonna have our first like uh, real estate tycoon who's a creator. Well, I think that'll happen. Oh. Yeah, who's going to be soon. our first, uh, I mean, I don't know, financial literacy creator that could hop on, like, you know. Those would be really like cool. I think they have been ginormous uh, right now. Like, there's so many real estate and financial, like, advisor type um, content creators. Yep. And people really love that, I think. Yeah, but I want, I want someone in, you know, home improvement. Mm. I can't wait until... Jake, he does his first Korean language podcast. I can't yeah, wait until love to do that. we have people from, you know, I want like a Nigerian teacher that's doing like, you know, Khan Academy. Like I, I want, you know, just people that are doing all different types of things, mm -hmm. connecting to connecting and creating communities all around the world. Right. Yeah. I think, I think t talk about wine being heliocentric. I, I, we talk about this all the time, you know, social media, content, pop culture. We think, especially we uh, Americans think that we're at the center of it all, but more people watch YouTube in India every single day than the entire population of the United States. Mm. Right. So yeah, that, that's probably. how small we are. Yeah. Right? So <clears throat> we always try to have that view. So thank you for saying that our network is wide, but I think as far as our aspirations, we hope it could be even wider. Yeah. yeah. Is there like a number one bucket list creator you want to work with next or in there's a lot elon yeah. musk wow. um i mean everybody and by the way don't don't take this as bad but i would want to talk to donald trump right i want mm. elon musk donald trump ray dalio uh you know bernie sanders bernie sanders is about to be a create he is a creator yeah you know what i mean he's starting his podcast i would love to talk to obama yeah you know what i mean he's he's yeah. an influencer now <laughs> you know what i'm saying so well, we had a really great one the other day we were talking about um how charlie munger just passed away and warren buffett and we're like uh, you know yeah warren buffett's a creator his annual newsletter that he writes his his annual shareholder statement that is that's that's a that's a Substack post yeah and then and then his, i love uh, what you said his right investors meeting where the gathering that he hosts in Omaha once a year is like the biggest IRL event. That's so true. Yeah, it's the biggest IRL event. Yeah. I mean, shit is ill. You know what I mean? You have people flying into Omaha f for no other reason than to check in with Warren wow. and the squad. You know true. what I mean? So it's, it's That's Ill. so yeah. funny. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that mm. people, you know, people trip out on. I, I would love to get like religious folks on. Yeah. Right. I want to talk to the Dalai Lama, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, or yeah, I want to talk to Joel Osteen. I want to talk to whoever, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, for us, the the Omaha, like Berkshire, Share, Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting is an IRL. I laughed. The, the other thing that's like that is like, you know, we always say this again, and I'm going to say it over and over and again. It's like when we say creator, community, serve, utility, you know, K-pop idols, you know, uh, someone is a cult of personality. All of these things, they're not just terms that you throw out. It's because for the people that are in those communities, it actually is a religion, mm. right? So like people don't like hearing that, especially if you're very pious or very religious, whatever you are, but it's true. Like yeah. when you take a step back, 
you you wearing a cross or a star of David, that's merch. That's, <laughs> that's you wearing a PewDiePie t-shirt. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You're, you're you're signaling to the world that that's what you are, right? Yeah. When you, yeah. When, I'm, a, I'm a Buddhist, and this is merch. <clears throat> this is my merch. That's merch, right? Yeah. This is yeah. And and guess what? If I really love, you know, I, I love the Mets, and instead of having a star of David or a cross, <laughs> I have the Mets logo on my on my neck. So, For sure. Yeah. I and mean, and if you subscribe to someone's Patreon, that's tiding, mm, right? If you, wow. you know, so that that's why we think it's so yeah. important. Mm. And before you used to be limited by where and how you could, you know, belong to these communities. But today, you know, you can, because of technology and readily available information, right. you could be in Singapore and listen to, you know, actually you grew up in Mexico, right? So my kids lis- literally listen to Peso Pluma and Blackpink. You know what I'm saying? Crazy, yeah. Like and they don't mm. and they don't really speak Korean or Spanish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like that isn't that wild? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. My mom listened to the Beatles and she doesn't speak fluent English, so that was. I mean, it was a different era. So yeah, now we're in that next phase of what that means of what you know multiculturalism means. Mm-hmm. You know. But speaking of multiculturalism, yeah, like what was it like growing up in Mexico? Hmm. Yeah, you said you went to American school where you were I out did. there, right? It was an American school, but very much ninety uh, percent were like privileged, like Mexican kids, um, and then just like a couple Asians, but they were majority like Koreans. So my class, for example, was a class of one hundred ninety kids, and out of those, fifteen were Korean. And that's like the most diversity we've ever had. Um, that being said, I don't think I experienced the same kind of racism, for example, that I would have experienced in the States. It was a little bit different. Like it was a different texture as I would like to call it. Um, but I don't know, it's it's kind of hard to explain. I think they were more accepting in that we I didn't experience the same kind of bullying or the same kind of like stereotypes necessarily. Um, but then there were some overlaps, but I don't know, very, very difficult to explain. Um, do you yeah. speak Spanish? I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's actually one of the next viral videos I had was me speaking Spanish, mm. uh, talking about my background, I guess. Yeah. And then people really like that. So going back to like that multicultural aspect, um, people really like that too. It's I think the largest creator, one of the largest vloggers in Mexico mm. is actually Korean, right? Mm. R- right, Song? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I forget his name, but there's another kid who's like Argentinian. El Coreano? Is it El Cor- oh. Is he is he Mexican or Argentinian? I think I think he's a Korean guy in Mexico, right? Yeah, he's a huge vlogger. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then your friend, the photographer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. One point eight million. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Holy crap. Yes, yeah, Hoju. She's she's also Mexican Korean. Do you speak Spanish with a Mexican accent? I do. It's very <laughs> much of a Chilanga accent. <laughs> so once I start saying words. Cabron. Yeah, <laughs> people know immediately. Like, where are you from? I'm like, oh, Mexico City. They're like, yeah, I can, I can tell. That must be so crazy working in uh, restaurants to be like you have a superpower. Oh, <laughs> so if they're talking spicy, yeah. like chinita, whatever, whatever, and then you're like, come on, son. Like, I know what you talked about, me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you approach the table with a big smile on your face. <laughs> and you kill them with kindness. You're like, yeah. oh, would you like some more, some more wine in Spanish? They're like. She knows what we said. <laughs> it's like, go yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it is definitely really helpful, especially because um, a lot of like the back of house or porters would be um, Spanish speaking yeah, a lot yeah, of the yeah, times. Yeah. And I can help the team out in terms of, like translating or if they have questions, they can't really communicate with the managers. I try to help in that. So it's I've been very grateful that I have that language skill. Yeah. Um, do you see any overlaps in which you use your skills as a designer uh, in, in, in what you do as a SOM? Hmm. I think maybe trying to read what people really want, because, uh, for example, if you do a lot of design freelancing, they would say something, but you still have to read between the lines and figure out what they want. So I think that's pretty ingrained in me. And that directly translates and it could go the other way into service where you're constantly trying to figure out what they actually want. Uh, so in that. But in terms of design strictly, I don't think so. Uh, maybe just creativity 
in general, but I not, mean, it probably yeah. helps with your content, though, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. It's hundred percent what I used to do, just for myself. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing: a lot of people think that um, making videos isn't is them expressing their creativity and being an artist. I actually think the best creators, the ones with the largest followings and the largest communities are the best designers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by design is that design is something that you do for them. And it's a service. It's a service of being able to provide as much information as possible in the, in the most concise sort of way, True, right? Yeah. The better the design is, you could, you, you could make so many different meanings mm -hmm. in that one little thing. That's right? true. But if you look at art, then you're putting all of that work onto the person that's actually looking at it. Mm -hmm. So I think so many people get that twisted where they're, they're like, oh, I'm trying to be creative. I want to be artistic now. If you want to do that, then be an artist. But if you want to be a creator or someone that's actually building a community, then do then be a designer. True. Yeah, I think being a content creator is more about being a problem solver because there's something people are looking for, whether it be entertainment or education or whatever it may be. And you are providing that service, like you said, and whatever it may be that you want to solve for them. So that's that's a really fresh take. And if you, you can't be an artist all the time. Even to for totally. Yeah, yeah. And there's also the practicality of people doing this. You can't be an artist in that. I think it was Pharrell. It's like uh, <coughs> art, <coughs> art without, I think it's like being creative or art without business is exploitation. And then, um, and then business without art is a big fucking waste of time, right? So it's like, yeah, you, you gotta be able to marry the, the practical aspects of being able to make design, serve in a, in a utility and value exchange sort of way. Yeah. Otherwise, and, and you can't just be a business that doesn't have that either, because then, then, then why are you really even doing it? True. You're not saying anything. Yeah. I've always wondered, uh, for full-time content creators, maybe it's like a very personal question oh, how do you guys like generate revenue for yourselves because we all have bills to pay in the end regardless of how much we like creating so how does that work for you guys it's always going to be a combination and it all depends on what kind of content and what kind of community you have mm. so generally speaking most people that start in content creation uh actually not even let, let me just outline a couple ways number one is platform revenue mm. if you get enough views of anything whether on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, whatever it might be, the platform will actually pay you because they're running ads against your stuff. So there's a general like little break that they give you, a cost per thousand views, right? Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two is like merchandise, right? At the end of the day, whether you want to merchandise your audience in a way where they're they're wearing a, a Mets logo or a cap or uh, or subscribing to, you know, like, uh, you know, your 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 wine service, I, you know, it, it it's, it's that, right? It's being able to essentially license or exploit your IP in that mm -hmm. way. And now there's all kinds of different ways. There's subscription in a broader way where just like Tiding, they're like, you know what? I just like what Jake he's doing. I don't, there's no expectation for him to do anything special. And sometimes they do do something special. Mm -hmm. They'll paywall certain things and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But at other times it's like, it's like Wikipedia or Craigslist. Like, oh, you want to, do you, do you find value in this? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Pat, pat. By the way, that's the, another way that that analogy becomes even stronger because when you go to a church or a temple or whatever, people tithe, but you're not required to pay. Yeah. When you when you pass the offering, you put in what you can, yeah. right? And I think that that's another real big source of revenue for for gener uh, for for creators. Um, and then the last one, which is the bulk of our revenue right now, is direct partnerships or sponsorships, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you have a ethos or a mission or brand values that are very clear and that aligns with either an audience that your audience or a community that this brand is trying to reach or a value that they're trying to convey, then they're going to reach out to you and say, hey, can we work together? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how we break down. I mean, that's, that's literally our revenue. Mm. I don't know if from a percentage standpoint, we'd probably do... 60% from branded partnerships, 30% from platform, and now, yeah, maybe 10% from miscellaneous other. I would say it's actually like 75% brand partnerships. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like 20, 25% like platform, mm -hmm. maybe even that. And then- Like events. Yeah, yeah, events mm -hmm. and all of that, but yeah, majority of it is just brand partnerships. Yeah. But, so, then, but then, by the way, and this is an important nuance, but that's because our audience is basically us in our, our community is us in age and demographic. Yeah. But if you look at like a lot of these YouTubers, their their audiences might be 20 times as big as ours, 
but they make no that like mm-hmm. all but then they could and they could also sell like 50 million dollars worth of hot topic t-shirts right or they might have like five times more audience than us but because of the nature of the content that they create is probably not the most brand friendly mm. um they're might they, they might not be able to monetize at all I see. Um, so it, it really depends on again like again it's it's purpose like what do you want to go after um yeah. and um if if you're going after it as an art project then yeah sure like don't expect it to be a design service or mm-hmm. don't expect it to be a business H- have you, you done know? any brand deals a few uh actually posting one tomorrow um but yeah I, trying to be picky um about what i accept because i'm sure you guys have a lot of like inbound yep. you know uh like love calls but I think similar, there's like a lot of random ones, a lot of things I don't really believe in. So can you yeah. share one that you've done that you're proud of? Uh, wine related, for sure. So oh. for example, one of them, one of my first ones was Coravan, which is like a like a gadget that pumps air in so you don't have to open a bottle of wine. That They paid me like nothing, to be honest, basically like very little money. But I was like, oh, I love this brand, so I'll work with them just because I like it. And then another one was with wine enthusiasts, um, but for their clients. Um, stuff like that has been pretty cool because yeah. um, it just means that there's people in that community with that backing kind of interested in working. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, Pe- uh, people who are stakeholders in these companies yeah. know what you're doing. They're interested in working with you. Yeah, that always is a great feeling. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you want to build upon more? I think so, definitely. Yeah. I hate to say, but... You know, gotta gotta pay the bills and save a little more. So, if the partnership makes sense uh, in terms of like going well with my content, I would probably look more into it or like accepting things that make sense. So everything right now has been inbound, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do work with a manager who's my friend. Also, she's also a content creator. Um, she has tried some outbounds, but not. Maybe I don't have enough followers yet. Uh, no success so far. What What are the dream brands that you would want to work with? I would love to work with some champagne houses. Honestly, I love champagne, but the ones I like. How like, many followers do you have on TikTok? TikTok 70, I think. And then you have 60 on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're small at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities that I we were able to manifest uh, when I had about like 20,000 on Instagram and, you know, I had a much sizable following on TikTok, but the vanity metrics were the concept of how many followers you have in order for you to uh, guarantee these brand deals. I think that notion is becoming more and more antiquated because mm. brands also understand that, oh, this person might have way less following than this other creator, but the engagement and the type of comments and the quality and the quality of the engagement is significantly you know, of more value. So they would actually, I think a lot of brands are starting to understand that we need to index more into these type of creators that <clears throat> have a stronger community than just having a big following. True. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're in the late majority stage of that mm-hmm. realization for most people. Adam Mosseri, the head of Instagram, I think two days ago, maybe yesterday, he literally said, your number of followers does not matter. This is the head of Instagram, by the way. He's like, the number of followers does not matter. You have to look at views and or or likes and comments. Hmm. If likes, if it's a photo and views, if it's a video True. and that engagement uh, far surpasses anything. I have, a, I have a question. So your second video that went viral was around um, uh, you speaking Spanish. Have you thought about uh, local localized programming? Um, because I think that that's a, we always think about advantages, right? Mm. World-class advantages that, that creators that come in here have. I mean, if you literally did three channels, one channel in English, one channel in Korean, one channel in Spanish, wouldn't you be able to triple your community? That is a very good point. And it's actually something I've been thinking a lot about because I gained crazy amount of followers from that one video, but a lot of them were Spanish-speaking followers. So uh, like a part of me is like, oh, should I, I should make more content that's in Spanish just so they get something to watch, not just like me, you know, although a lot of them speak English as well. So something I've been considering, but I haven't really pulled the trigger yet. I mean, I think just meeting you today, though, <clears throat> I mean, we talk about ultimate utility and value. If I'm in Korea and I start to watch your stuff, you have access to 
the New York City food and wine scene, but you could also tell me and share with me in a, in a way that most people can't. So you have proximity, you have language, you have access, you have all of these things that instantly, in addition to the thing that you actually do, which is good, like good enough for people who want to tune in, I don't know. I think that that might be an opportunity for you, especially like I, what I, what very limited stuff I know about Andre Mack, right? But with him, what's su super obvious is I see a guy in a beanie that knows a shit ton about wine. Oh, coincidentally, yeah, he yeah. always rocks a red beanie. Yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a beanie, right? And then now I actually saw videos of him where he he's uh, he's responding to scenes. You know the GQ, um, you know how they have like a stunt man doing they, uh, like a, a gangster watching a gangster flick and then breaking down the scene. Right, right, right. A right. stunt man breaking down a, a, a scene, right? They have Andre Mack breaking down a scene. So there was a scene in Succession where one of the brothers talks about like, oh, I'm doing this wine. I'm super decanting. And da, da, da. and he, he he breaks down. He's like, just no, don't do that. <laughs> he goes, don't, don't do that, right? So, but when I see that, I'm like, oh, here's someone that A, understands the platform. He's not trying to do what he does on you know, Top Chef mm. or on the Food Network. He understands what's going on on TikTok, on Instagram. So number one. Number two, he also is a face that I very candidly would not think of putting on wine. I would think of like the stodgy old dude, old whoever that's like, yo, wine is fancy. So you kind of flip mm. that. I think you have the same opportunity where you're like, you know, you're young, you're in New York, you're trilingual, like you're all these other things that like instantly I think make you tremendously value valuable to someone like uh, the owner of Chambers who can't reach those audiences that you can. Mm. She's probably trilingual too. <laughs> oh, is she? Yeah, she's well, French. <laughs> oh, well, definitely. Uh, they speak four languages for sure. Yeah. 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 She, if she's Swiss, it's like oh, forget yeah, about it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but she doesn't speak Spanish. Where I mean, she probably speaks Spanish, but mm. the Spain Spanish. Yeah, they're speaking like Bastille or Casti Castiano, and you're like, yo, I'm gonna break it down for all my people <laughs> in North America, in yeah. Central America, yeah. South America. Yeah. Mm, definitely something to think about. But it's really crazy to think, um, or just like. How do I how do I phrase this? Almost validating to hear you say that because for me, um, being a woman in this industry, although despite all these you know things I can bring to the table, I always think of as a disadvantage, right? Because in my mind, because I've experienced so many things on the floor where they see me, I'm a tiny Asian woman, they're like, oh, where's a the song? They're like, oh, you're talking to one. So my mind has kind of been in this like rut where oh. I had to prove them wrong. I had to constantly, like, I almost have a chip on my shoulder sometimes mm -hmm. thinking like, oh, I have to constantly prove to them that I know what I'm talking about. And hearing you say that I have advantages because of these factors in a way, because of my background is a very refreshing take that I should flip my mindset on. I, I just realized. Because at the end of the day, once you have a bigger community, hmm. yeah, man, like numbers don't lie. You know what I mean? Well, and, and my, my, my thing would be like, what what is a bigger we talk about addressable markets all the time mm. so are there more fancy people or more everyday people are there more spanish speak like even just language mm. right even just language span like the demographics of just the united states i would say a third of the united states speaks spanish mm -hmm. right so again we we get so we get so bogged down in these like in what we think the view of the world is but like you know how many people speak Spanish in the world? That's probably the what third yeah. most spoken language. I would say English, Mandarin by sheer I think size. English is like less than a bill. <laughs> less than a bill. Less so the, a it bill, might not I even think. be the number one most spoken. Yeah, because yeah. America's three hundred M, and then UK. I don't know how many people there is. Well, but, Australia. Yeah, but Australia. Come on, it's a continent. Population. Bro. Yeah. It's not yeah. like yeah. the population is. Yeah, massive. it's like forty million maybe. You yeah. know, English one, uh -huh. Mandarin oh, Chinese two. Yeah, so I was right. Hindi three. And yeah. Then Spanish. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's top five. Yeah, but is English one as the first language or as a language mm. that is an option for everybody? Okay. No, English has to be the most spoken language in the world. Right. Okay. It's Fair like, enough. It's the default operating system. Lingua Francois, the <laughs> new. <laughs> well, Lingua Francois, you, you know, like that—that's the international passport language. They that were very was, proud of that. That was for a time. very long time. Now the motherfuckers are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> America, USA. Well, um, hey. Nah, I love France. Um, uh, no, but no, but for real, I, I think that that's that's like a huge addressable market. I mean, mm -hmm. I would I would lean into that. Yeah, I, I would lean into young. I would lean into 
women. Yeah. Mm. Is that a big challenge still, being a woman song? Surprisingly, sometimes okay. uh, very rude awakening of reality. Yeah, I, you would think like 21st century, who cares? Like, but there are small subsets um, now and then. Being being able to re redefine and, and and show that like, you know, it can be something else. And again, you have that world class advantage and fluency. Mm. Yeah, I mean, by no means we're saying, oh, you got a bigger following, so like you're better, we're hotter, where you're, you know, you know what you're talking about mm -hmm. more. I, that's not what we're yeah, indicating totally. at all. What I what I am saying though, I want to be clear, is I think you could provide more utility to more people. Mm. I, what I what I could, yeah. So to summarize that into you probably have more impact to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. You're right. Yeah. By no means we're saying that you are, you know, more sophisticated. Yeah, you, you have more knowledge than some of these people who's been in the industry for, for so, so much long. longer. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's just that because, uh, yeah, like I had this conversation with some acclaimed chefs as well. Like, you know, when TikTok started, started popping off, there was there was a whole string of TikTok cooks that were you know, getting um, restaurant deals right. and, you know, book deals. And many of them, I don't even know what they're up to it anymore, but traditional cooks and chefs obviously felt a certain way about mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? And out of that mist, uh, out of that batch of creators that, you know, some of them have transcended into becoming more than a TikTok cook. Mm -hmm. And they, they now have their own brick and mortar restaurants wow. and they're doing their own thing. And I think, you know, whenever there's anything that's new, the automatic reaction is that ain't real hip hop. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that ain't real. Um, and I think it's better to be more embracive and just understand what the opportunities are than trying to lock it, you know, trying to yeah. suppress that. Yeah, has anyone called you a TikTok Psalm? I've heard a couple of times, uh, even when they run into me at the restaurant, like occasionally people recognize me and then they would be like, oh my God. They turn to their friend and be like, that's a TikTok song. I'm like, hi, hello. I'm also a real song. <laughs> like I work yeah. here. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. I'm the TikTok guy. Yeah. The, I'm well, that, well, that's what TikTok I'm saying. TikTok food guy. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think people, real creators that embrace that they then they become like the new leaders in every mm. space because you're like Jimmy Donaldson he has an Amazon show 100 million dollar Amazon show Mr Beast but he he's like I'm a YouTuber mm. and and all I want to be is a YouTuber wow right so it's like yeah I'm the yeah. TikTok song <laughs> Hello. yeah I I am and by the way which content do you watch the one in Korean the one in English the one in Spanish it's like I can I can appeal mm. and 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 uh connect with so many more folks you yeah know? anyway so can you actually recommend um, some wine for us? Yeah, um, let's go by occasion. Yeah. Right? Okay, so why so don't like, you start it off? Uh, so Jake, he just celebrated a birthday and we're going to go out tonight, actually. So, uh, yeah, wh what's a good uh, four wine sort of pairing, I guess, for the night? Yeah. So what's what are you eating? Number one. Uh -huh. And like price range, perhaps uh, would be the two biggest things. Okay, uh, price range. I guess uh, we did okay these few months. <laughs> so, <laughs> like two hundred and fifty. Okay, per for the, bottle. For per bottle, bottle. Or, per bottle, or yeah, total. To two hundred per bottle, maybe a okay. hundred per bottle. Okay. Let's start with a hundred per bottle. Well, yeah. so actually, can we break that down? Actually, yeah. break it down for our audience. So, mm -hmm. I think the there's like, is do they still have two buck chuck? They probably do, right? The, the Trader Joe two dollar. Probably. Okay, so. The way I think of wine, I think of it as like, okay, I want a twenty dollar bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want a fifty dollar bottle. Uh -huh. I want a hundred dollar bottle, and then a two hundred dollar bottle. I mean, but are you looking at that from a restaurant with the markup, or are you looking at it from? No, the, this is me going to Total Wine. Okay. Like Bevmo, oh, yeah, Bevmo yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Right? Is that even the? And then after two hundred, I'm like, then it's you know it's whatever. Like gotta be yeah, a big well, yeah, occasion. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that right? Like, I'm sure the the industry actually has segments for this. There has to be a segment around like the twenty dollar bottle or the fifty dollar bottle. Is there? Uh, not officially, but yeah, I would, I could, okay. I think there's a couple people like have in the back pocket okay. for those. Um, but yeah, if it's like list price, I don't know, I, if you're celebrating, if it's something remotely celebratory <sighs> or even if it's not, you, I love sparkling wine in general. So I would go like a Cremant for like a lower price range, like Cremant de Loire. I love like a sparkling Shannon, delicious, not that pricey mm -hmm. for like the lower 
and uh, there's expensive ones, but something like that. Or of course, champagne. Uh, depends on what you like, but you know, there's a lot that's very, I think, not too crazy out there. Like Tarlant, even that is like probably 150 on the list, I think, depending on the cuvee. So that'd be really cool, really delicious champagne. Or you could go like grower producers under 200, uh, like Pierre Peters would be excellent. Paul Barr, I think, would be in that range too. So definitely starting with them bubbles. Okay. And then Start you can go into Riesling. Riesling, okay. I think Riesling goes well with everything, and I think most people would agree with that. What is Riesling? Riesling is a type of grape. So um, the most famous ones are from Germany. So it's like the ones that come from like the slender bottles. Um, there is a wide range of sugar levels, so you can choose that range. And is it goes higher well. the sugar levels? Do you get a bigger headache the next day, or it has no so direct correlation? Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it is truly alcohol content itself. Mm. But then, the higher the sugar level, the lower the alcohol actually, because the alcohol gets produced by the yeast eating the sugars. Mm. So it's like an inverse relationship. But riesling also is very tart. Um, has a higher acidity level, so it's a really food friendly wine, and that would go well with anything, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah, got you. All right, so start with bubbles, start with bubbles. We're gonna go to Riesling, then go to Riesling. What do we, what do we, what should we bring to wrap it up, wrap up the evening? Well, then you'd probably go to some sort of a red and then end with like a dessert mm. wine or something. Yeah. Uh, are we talking like, are you eating seafood or are you eating like duck? I think it's a combination. I think it's of literally both that. duck. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, then probably like a lighter medium red. Um, I, I love burgundy. Burgundy. Yeah. So I have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Um, so like a Bourgogne, like village level or like a regional level, still delicious in my opinion. Um, so if you what is a village pretty. level and a regional level? Yeah. So if it's from Burgundy as a whole, you call it Bourgogne. Um, and that's like the grapes can come from anywhere in that Burgundy region. Okay. And if it's a village level, they're like little towns. So it's like drawing a map and drawing borders. If it comes from one specific uh, town or village, then that's like a village level. And then there are like vineyard levels that have like certain um, like very famed vineyard sites that they give so another within, class. So it gets more and more specific. Exactly. Like it's more and more micro. Yo, you from like Harlem and this yes. vineyard is in 125. <laughs> yeah. And, and the 125 vineyard is a claim. I yeah. mean, Harlem was a horrible <laughs> example for, uh, I mean, yeah, for a vineyard. But yeah, yeah so it, it would be basically breaking it down in that 100%. sense. Got like, you. The analogy I like to make is from New York. So uh, the regional level would be more New York City. You know, you yeah. have your five boroughs, so that would be like sub-regions. Yeah. And then, for example, let's say Manhattan. Within Manhattan, there are different neighborhoods. Yeah. And within neighborhoods, there's like a really famous street or corner, like maybe yeah. it's Dime Square. And within Dime Square, there's like that specific coffee let's, let's shop you like. Let's redo that. Let's, yeah. let's take Dime Square out of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's redo that. Let's just say okay. St. Mark's, for instance. All right, St. Mark's. Within St. Mark's, there's, uh, I don't know, like, some people like to go to Kenka for after drinks or yeah. some people like on a hot pot in that street. So something like that, it's just different preferences people like. And I think the same thing applies for wines. Yeah. yeah. So in that sort of, I guess, uh, system, where do you think is the most overrated and where do you think is the most underrated sort of like mm. things? Ooh, that's really hard. Um, Hot take, and this this yeah. episode is gonna get a lot of comments. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do feel like after a certain price point, um, considering not everyone's made out of money in this world, after a certain price point, everything is overrated, in my opinion. Um, unless you can truly afford those wines and dish out ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars, beyond a certain point, no wine's ever gonna measure up. What's that point? Oof. Oh, God. Don't cancel me. Uh, even DRC, I feel, which is one of the most venerated producers, like after like some of these can cost tens of thousands of dollars, right? Um, and auctions and they're insane. Can you really, really justify that price point? It doesn't even have to be just DRC. It could be anything else. Um, I, I personally don't know if I can strongly agree mm -hmm. uh, just because a lot of these markups and auctions are, again, after a certain point, just hype 
and branding almost. So that would be in a way overrated. Not because the wine itself is not good. Like they are freaking phenomenal, amazing. It's just we're talking the price to value point. And I think underrated, uh, I love French wine. So a lot of these are French. Um, I love Loire Valley. I think there's such good deals there. Um, it's actually hard to sell Loire Valley wines, even on the list, even if they're fairly priced. So Why is that? Because it um, doesn't have the same marketing as some I of the think, other brand yeah. names. It's just not as well known, mm. um, although it, there's so much diversity there and just so many gr- amazing producers. Um, Sincere, of course, is very well known. That's from the Loire. But other than that, I think it's just pure uh, lack of exploration from the market. Um, I think there's so much opportunity there. So you're you're also a whiskey. You're into whiskey too, right? Yeah. Is there a so one of the interesting things about whiskey that I saw was, um, you know, like Asian East Asian countries took to Scotch in particular, and they were like, mm-hmm. "This is ph- phenomenal," and you guys have been doing it for, you know, hundreds of years. We want to do that too. And then you start to see like the Japanese whiskeys, the Taiwanese whiskeys come out of nowhere and start essentially winning, right? Mm. Is Are there versions of that in the wine world? Very amazing yeah, like question. like Mongolian yeah. wine, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a, like a lot of Chinese wine producers have been growing, wine, yeah. uh, growing uh, grapes in Mongolia, right? Inner Mongolia, I've heard different sources. I forget sources. exactly where, but yeah. I, I tried a, a Chinese wine a couple weeks ago. It was delicious. Um, I think there's there are preconceived notions just because people are so fixated on the now very archaic vision of what wine is, this fancy schmancy thing. So Chinese wines apparently are very up and coming and Japanese wines have been blowing up. Um, Very hard to get, very allocated. um, And they're just, the craftsmanship I feel is just very insane. It's incredible. And I've only tried like one or two ever, but people are turning to that Asian winemaking too. Yeah, really appreciate you bringing me on. This is super fun. I thought it would be like really awkward. No, no, no. This is great. No, thank you for coming on. (laughs)